we'll say that. So the way we have planned this session is uh, we have three expert talks from actual designer or manufacturer's uh, surgeon who have contributed a lot to the development of those particular schemes. So that will take about 20 minutes. Then we have a good panel here who is experienced in robotic surgery. So we'll be putting up some questions and uh, obviously take their opinion. So that'll take about half an hour. And then five minutes, if it is there, we'll open up for the discussion from the house. So everyone is there on the panel? Yes, so can we please start with our first uh, pre-recorded talk, please? I'm Dr. David Rubinsky from the University of Hawaii, and I'll be doing an overview of the robot and the philosophies for robotic as knee replacement every time with good alignment, range of motion, and stability. I started using computer navigation in the early 2000s, and it was confusing to me why this never became the standard of care. And surgeons would tell me, it slows me down, my patient's doing fine, show me the outcomes are better. Well, we know the outcomes are better with navigation, we have better alignment, particularly femoral rotation, and longevity is improved, but computer navigation has its limitations. It's really two-dimensional planning. So you get your distal femur cut, your femoral rotation, your proximal tibia cut, your gap balancing, still much better than manual instrumentation. Now, you can have errors of block instability, but even if the block is solid, there's play between the saw blade and the slot. And the saw blade thicknesses vary from 1.3 to 1.7 millimeters. And the saw blade additionally can <clears throat> flex as you're making a cut, particularly as you go towards the back of the knee. In, we're doing a more industrial operation. So we have to think about computer-aided design, and CNC or computer numeric control machining for precision. And I want efficiency, precision, and flexibility. Every robot in the market has to do three things, registration, planning, and bone preparation. Registration is getting the information into the computer. Some systems require a preoperative imaging with CT or MRI, but you still have to do intraoperative mapping of some surface points on the knee because you have to relate the plan to the knee to the trackers and this can potentially introduce error other systems will do direct digital mapping of the surface of the knee and we'll show you that later on and of course registration should include soft tissue information so we can do good gap balancing now there's planning and the planning can be done preoperatively or intraoperatively so if it's done preoperatively it's done in conjunction with an industry representative that may be an engineer or maybe a technician and you have to approve the plan before you go to surgery. And then you're limited to executing that plan. So if you're planning a uni, you have to do a uni. If you're planning a total, you do a total. I like having the flexibility intraoperatively to make that decision. And I like to have wide variability of planning choices, whether it's measured resection or kinematic alignment or gap balancing. And true robotic bone preparation is with a robotic arm. So bone preparation can be autonomous or semi-autonomous. So fully autonomous robots like these are very large, very expensive, but once you've got your registration and plan, you set the knee firmly in position and then the arm will automatically mill the bone in preparation for the components. Most of us are using semi-autonomous systems. So this is another system that is a semi-autonomous system. So it requires a CT scan for registration preoperative planning. And then if you want to have flexibility, you have to do two separate plans, a uni and a total, if you want to have that option. And then the saw is attached to a robotic arm. The saw blade is two millimeters thick. So you can be very precise with this system, but the robot arm is controlling you and preventing you from cutting outside the plan. So the registration is digital mapping. So we're making an outline of the knee, and then there's a database of more than 10,000 CT scans. And from that database, it pulls up a mesh that's about the same size and shape of the knee we're working on today. Then we color the surface and we get a three-dimensional real-time map of the cartilage surface of the knee. We also have additional information for reference of the alignment of the limb. We gather the gap balancing information by ranging the knee, full range of motion, getting MCL and LCL stresses for gap balancing. And you can plan any way you wish. You can do mechanical alignment, kinematic alignment. You can use gap balancing if you wish, and you can use a variety of implants. It's your choice. This flexibility is critical. The milling tool is designed specifically for total knee applications. It's paired with a very fast camera. So there's sub-millimeter accuracy of the bone preparation. 
the preparation for me for total knee takes about six minutes for partial knee about three minutes what i like is that this hand piece has integrated suction and irrigation so it keeps the bone cool that's really important this whole system is very small in its footprint it's about the size of an arthroscopy cart it's very efficient i'm definitely faster with the robot than i am with manual instrumentation now, one objection or challenge with robotics or any technology is a learning curve because registration, planning, and bone preparation are unique. So one unique complication with navigation and with robotics is periprosthetic pin fractures. They're extremely rare. Our experience has been 0.01%. So overall, this is a nice study looking at 850,000 patients in a database, and they found that the utilization of robotic-assisted surgery has increased 600%. And I think the future is pooling this data for machine learning. So you can look at 10,000 knees that are size five that were done with the quarry system for a 10 degree varus deformity and get a good prediction of cuts that you would use in the operation. And I do believe that robotic assisted surgery will become the standard of care for knee replacement. So thank you very much for your attention and mahalo nui loa and I wish I was there in person, but I appreciate being invited to participate in this excellent conference. Aloha. That was Dr. David Roinsky. He's a designer for Cori. The next talk also is a virtual talk by Dr. Sean Toomey, who's been using uh, Mako for the last 12 years, and he's a designer uh, surgeon for Mako. Happy holidays and happy new year to all my friends and colleagues in India who are participating in this meeting. I wish to thank Drs. Patil and Shah, along with the members of the prestigious Bombay Orthopedic Society, for asking me to participate in this Western India Regional Orthopedic Conference. I am grateful that I have met many of your members in person, but even far more through remote training sessions on robotic-assisted hip and knee replacement surgery. It has been a true pleasure to share what knowledge and understanding that I have of this advanced technology. As some of you already know, my journey with robotic-assisted surgery started back in 2009 when I became interested in a better way to execute partial knee replacement surgery. At that time, a small startup orthopedic tech company called Mako was showcasing this technology at our National Academy meeting. While I then recognized that this technology had great potential, I never envisioned what a disruptive force it would have in orthopedics. Over the course of the next year, I became fully trained on the first application to include medial, lateral, patellofemoral, and bicompartmental knee replacement. In 2010, I performed the first Mako replacement in the northwestern part of the United States. Over the next 12 years, I saw Mako get acquired by a larger company, after which the total hip and then total knee applications were added. To date, I have performed as a single solo surgeon over 6,000 robotic-assisted hip and knee replacement surgeries. It has been such a great journey to be part of as the technology and conversations continue to evolve. Digital software enhancements, such as Mako PKA 3.0, which includes Titan resection tolerances, to added efficiency with the saw cut option, to total hip 4.0, which allows for incorporation of lumbar spine and sacral slope parameters to address the spinal pelvic relationship, virtual range of motion assessment to assess for potential impingement and allowing for posterolateral direct anterior or direct superior approaches for multiple implant choices, including the cemented Exeter stem, as well as the newest proximal canal filling stem. I've been fortunate to participate on the limited market release of Mako 2.0 and to date have performed over 100 cases. I'm pleased to report that the anticipated upgrades are worth the wait. While there's definitely a bit of an adjustment for those of us well accustomed to make a 1.0, a learning curve to adoption is quite small in my opinion. What is really exciting about all this is how the conversations in orthopedics are changing and evolving as they are impacted by this enhanced technology. There's more and more talk of individualized alignment, whether it's in the hip or the knee. What should our target really be and how we are best to achieve it? I would reference the paper by Dr. Ashish Singh looking at robotic-assisted hips for fused hips and ankylosing spondylitis patients as an example. 
There are discussions and debates over pre-resection workflow versus mid-resection workflow for the total knee. Debates over the best way to achieve functional knee positioning, whether from a mechanical alignment start or an individualized alignment start, or should we be using an adjusted mechanical alignment, or perhaps a restricted kinematic alignment, or even an inverse kinematic alignment. It is safe to say that the soft tissue envelope around the knee is getting far more attention than in the past, and the number of soft tissue releases much less. I humbly say that I've been somewhat of a unique perspective and that I've got to see and visit with surgeon colleagues in multiple different countries around the world, but not India yet. And if anything I've learned is that my patient population is very different from that in Japan or China or Australia, and that the techniques that I'm very comfortable with using the robotic technology may not apply to my surgeon colleagues in their countries. Hence, I'm always learning. We are always learning. Lastly, there is the relatively new concept of advanced digital healthcare, which is where our technology partners offer differentiated digital solutions to help us as users improve lives throughout a patient's healthcare journey. We have access to data at every step in the continuum. Let's use, for example, robotic assisted joint replacement surgery. Data is collected from all the preoperative MACO CT scans, all the intraoperative MACO session files. It can be collected with wearable technology such as motion sense. Then there is hospital data and patient reported outcomes provided by programs such as insightful data analytics when it is available and permitted in your area. All this data is brought together and synthesized to produce a unique view of a surgeon's practice, a group practice, a patient's joint journey experience, or even a hospital's efficiencies. These innovative products with digital driven capabilities are generating insights to drive improved clinical, operational, and financial outcomes across the continuum of patient care. There's one thought that I'd like to leave with you. I see this technology continuing to evolve over the years to come. I've had a chance to peek upstream on the development side and see what is coming, and I'd like to tell you that it is very exciting. I see enhanced automation and concepts such as AutoSolve, along with revision capabilities on both the hip and knee sides in the not too distant future. I know that there is continued discussion as to whether robotic assisted surgery is worth the cost of development and deployment, but in my opinion, on review of the majority of clinical results, it has been a good thing for our patients and our practices. Robotic assisted surgery, whether you choose to believe in it or not, is here to stay. Thank you. With that, I'd like to share with you one of my patients' recent responses for MAKO 2.0. Right, yeah. finished. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, can I now invite uh, my friend Dr. Chandrasekhar Prakash from Bangalore, who is going to give us a talk on image-based active robotics, my workflow. Dr. Chandrasekhar has uh, been doing this work since uh, two years now, and he has got probably the highest number of robotic surgery done He's from Bangalore. Dr. Chandrasekhar, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vairak. Uh, dear chairpersons, good evening, everybody. Good, uh, good evening, panelists. So I'll be talking on image-based active robotic arthroplasty. So why image-based? My experience was, I was, a, I was a navigating surgeon. I still navigate. So why I moved on to robotics and what are the advantages in the image-based active robotics? So this is where I come from. I come from Bangalore, India. And any, any successful totally arthroplasty uh, relies on good bony and soft tissue uh, balancing and to achieve that either you can have gap balancing or measured resection techniques, good component fixation, which your philosophy alignment you follow whether it is kinematic, inverse, functional alignment or mechanical up to you, but the implant should survive as long as possible. That's the whole uh, sole purpose and patient satisfaction and alignment does matter, which your philosophy you are, you, you can do mechanical, functional, inverse kinematic, kinematic up to you. So technology adoption is on rise and cost of robotic surgery is definitely a capital investment for the hospital. So any robotics, whether it is image or imageless robotic, we should have 
uh, the surgeon complete uh, control in all the three axes, coronal, rotational and sagittal plane. So these are the types of robots, automatic, semi-automatic and passive systems. And if you see the evaluation of navigation to robotics, it was image-based navigation, but the CT scan and the difficult segmentation way back led to imageless navigation. Imageless navigation success led to imageless robotic. And now because of the better CT scan and better segmentation, we have renewed interest in the image-based robotic TKI. So these are the differences between the image and imageless. So in image robots, you have accurate definition of the geometric axis and planes because you have the preoperative CT scan. You have preoperative planning, uh, which a surgeon spends about a couple of minutes before he gets into the theater, he plans the knee. And there is a boundary control, whereas in one of the system, it is a haptic control in the system which I use, QS system, it's to do something called bone movement monitoring, but both have a boundary control. And if there is any violation of the boundary by the robot, the robot automatically stops. The only co cons is cost of CT scan and the radiation exposure to the patient. And in the imageless robots, the advantages are logistically it's easier, no need for any CT and MRI. Uh, it's, it's my opinion that uh, it's difficult to paint the posterior half of the condyles in, in a very tight knees, especially if you have very severe varus and flexion deformity knees. But anyway, they have, it has an inbuilt image uh, data library, shape library from which the image is generated. And with increased acquisition time, shouldn't be an issue for an experienced surgeon who is doing an imageless robot. Probably yes, some time on the intraoperative planning, which can be cumbersome, but yes, with an experience, I don't think so, it should be an issue. Malleolar markings might be a bit tough in an obese uh, uh, patient. Sometimes erroneous malleolar markings can occur. And also issues with the rotational element, because especially the epicondyles wrapped around the soft, soft tissues, sometimes can be very difficult to mark. And uh, many studies have shown that even the experienced surgeons can go wrong in marking the epicondyles. So these are the available robots, uh, Curexo, uh, the Merrill guys have it, Stryker, they have Mako, Zimmer, uh, Rosa they have, and Smith and Nephi they have Navier, Corey, and then Wellis is now from debut. So I am using this uh, Curexo robot, which is a six axis articulated robot. It's a CT based robot, based on uh, optical tracking system. It's a point picking, not a surface mapping. We have uh, some points on the femur, some points on the tibia. You can, you can choose either the measure resection or gap balancing, gap technique, balancing technique. It's an automatic robot. So these are the parts of the robot. You have three things. One is a pre-plan, one is a robotic milling arm to uh, mill the bone, and then there is a navigation camera to capture the knee anatomy. So this is how the patient comes for, for surgery, CT done, surgical planning is done, loaded on the robotic machine. Then there is a registration of the knee, which is captured through OTS by the navigation camera. Then there is a gap check, preoperative gap check. You can move the knee from 0 to 120 degree and see the coronal and sagittal deformities. And then you can proceed either with the modified gap or measured resection up to you. Or if you want to, if your philosophy is functional alignment or mechanical, or if you want to do kinematic up to you, and then get, proceed with the gap checks and then go for the implantation. So this is the preoperative CT scan, which is aimed at uh, making, the, first the CT is made from hip, knee, ankle, and then we measure some points on the femur and some on the uh, hip center and the femur and mark the transepicondylar axis, posterocondylar axis, and then we see how the prospectively the implant sits both on the posteromedial condyle, posterolateral condyle. We also see how the implant fits in mediolaterally, distally, mediolaterally, anteriorly. So we all agree that there are some knees which are ML bigger and AP smaller, some knees are AP bigger and ML smaller. So the, the CT gives all the benefits, like uh, it, you, you can manipulate your implant depending on what is best suited for you. You can play the game of rotations, you can play the sagittal offset, that's up to you. So this is this, and also how the rotations behave to each other, how the epicondylar axis behaves with the PCA, you can see. And whatever the registration points, what you choose on the CT gets compared with the registration points, what you do on the, uh, on the surgery. So if there is any erroneous marking, you can always, uh, uh, go ahead and remark the knee. So that's one of the biggest benefits of uh, CT based robots. So you also mark some points on the tibia, that's the center of tibia and then you center of ankle for mechanical axis. And then you also see for the slope of the tibia and uh, you also see how the cut surface looks. These are all done pre-op and uh, once you're done with the planning, you the, the surgical plan result will come out which gets loaded on the uh, robotic machine. This is the last chart where uh, the what you have planned, it gets loaded on the uh, robotic machine and then the surgeon proceeds with the surgery. So these are the benefits of CT scan. Accesses all three, 
you know the implant position middle lateral and distal surface middle lateral and anterior surface you know the you know the, you can mimic good posture control or offside minimize the instrument slope of tibia is well appreciated sagittal implant positioning flex or extend the component you know what to play because you know the posterior half you know how the implant sits posteriorly no hip rotations are required no malleolar marking is done comparison of some of the points in the ct scan registration points what your pre plan gets compared with the per operative planning Uh, some of the missed talus and ankle lesions which would have easily missed with an x-ray ct will definitely show in some cases maybe 10 out of 1000 maybe like 1 in 100 so this is how the uh, this is how the uh, uh, posterior condylar symmetry so if you see by changing the implant sizes from one size below and one size up you exactly know how the implant is fitting to the condyles both the medial and the lateral condyle posterior condyle and then sorry so this is the validation of the ct points sorry okay i think some problem with the slide so this is the surgery of the uh, qvis you mark some points in the femur and tibia there are femur navigation pins and tibial navigation pins then this is called final rmsc which you seen on the screen this is the balance chart you can you can either balance your uh, do as a measured resection or a gap balancing whichever way you are comfortable once you are done then you connect the robot to the patient body and then go ahead with the cutting you can either use the metaphyseal clamps or you can use the pins that's up to you we never had any fractures with the metaphyseal clamps this is just a 3/4 cancellous portion uh, pins so this is how the robotic cuts are made sequence of uh, cuts you can choose you can go from distal femur to tibia balance the knee from extension to flexion you can do the posterior cut and then tibia balance the knee from flexion to extension you want to do measured resection you can do if you want to do functional alignment keeping the tibia and varus all this up to you intraoperatively you don't have to plan the you have to don't have to follow the rigid pre op plan it gives all the options to change you as per the soft tissue requirement once the robot does all the milling then the surgeon puts the trial implant then again sees how the uh, the ligament looks how the soft tissue balancing looks like from flexion to extension then he proceeds with the final implantation it also does the keel if you are interested some, uh, as a surgeon i just that do the tibia i don't do the keel but it's up to you and once you do you see the trial you see the numbers and you see the tracking and then go ahead with the implantation so this is the benefits of sagittal of that by placing the implant position by flexing 2 to 3 degrees it alters the gap both in flexion and extension gaps leads to cumulative change in the gaps so this sagittal offset i though i was navigating before i could not do it because i didn't know the posterior condylar symmetry now i know how we can manipulate because i know the condylar symmetry so i can play the sagittal offset until 2 to 3 degrees of flexion i don't keep more than that so this is the sagittal offset video i think some problem so these are the intraoperative options if you see once you mark the knee these are the options which are provided depending on the soft tissue need either you can internal or external rotate the femur you can flex or extend the component you can do varus or valgus to the component you can also hinge one side and then chain the varus valgus so the guys who are doing functional alignment do this on the tibia also you see all the options flexion extension you can do varus valgus on the tibia you can chain the slope so this is the minimal uh, minimal instruments and uh, assistants are required basically uh, the entire mill goes through the soft tissue it's a 4 mill 4.5 mm mill which goes and cuts uh, and also uh, i don't subluxate the tibia at all because the cuts are made in one static position and this is again the uh, pre and post op x rays some of the x rays some of the x rays of the x rays can you please uh, conclude dr chandrashekhar please yeah may, maybe 30 seconds so this is our experience so i don't uh, do any subluxation of the tibia no hard or any bony any recuts are done minimal soft tissue retraction whichever way your alignment philosophy you can go ahead this is our experience duration of surgery is increased by 16 minutes length of stay has decreased and these are the intraoperative changes which changed uh, in sagittal position in 95 position rotation in 90 tibial changes in 60% femur size if you see hardly 5 times 5% we change for the plan from pre op recuts were done only in 3% the infection rates are comparable reduction in the rehab sessions 95% is mechanical and 5% is functional 
these are the current studies in our institution these are some of the data so the, the take home message last there are some points to consider cost of surgery increased by 3.5% surgery time by 17 minutes infection rate similar to non robotic tka consumable usage definitely more pre plan time is surgeon has to spend 4 5 minutes before surgery increase in the ot personnel one and capital investment for the hospital there is one navigation pin bracket no fracture and robot does what you say but you are the brain behind it long term longevity is required in our robotic uh, studies and then thank you so much uh, thank you very much dr chandrashekhar thank you for a lovely talk yeah. we've got an eminent panel uh, nobody requires an introduction uh, and i think we have running late of time so we'll start with uh, the questions with them uh, dr mahesh kulkarni why did you think about changing from conventional to robotic so the games of the uh, this thing is you know the questions will come to a specific uh, person you answer that rest of the panel if they want to add something then just say otherwise i will move on to the next question from being a big skeptic of robotic system because i thought it was mainly based on marketing um the pandemic helped me in observing a hip replacement being performed by a american surgeon and i saw it on zoom and i i was um really uh, gobsmacked to see the precision with which the hip replacement was done the 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 speed of surgery and i was a complete convert after actually watching a hip replacement rather than a knee replacement so for me the conversion happened because of um getting answers to the questions that i had about a hip replacement restoring offset length getting the spino pelvic uh, conundrum solved so all of these actually stimulated me to look at um, robotics in a fresh way anyone, anyone wants else? to add anything i think i was a navigator Un yeah from so conventional to robotics that no, question will come robotics is just a step ahead and i think i should be in with time and robotics gives me three dimensional control what he mentioned about all the axis and that's really great and with the saw system what i had i had the same feeling what i had before yeah there's definitely a lot of literature available now about patient satisfaction at the same time early discharge and early return to work but i want to ask dr anup how did you change or why did you change from navigation to robotic because yeah. doing well with navigation and then robotic comes in yeah so navigation you cut with a saw and then you check so especially in the sagittal plane you suppose you plan 3 degree flexion but your saw cuts 6 degree flexion all you can do is check or you plan a 3 degree slope it cuts a 6 degree slope you can just check and do nothing about it but the sagittal control of the cuts is far better with robotics than it is with navigation yeah you in tejas your opinion hello so i agree with dr jurani but also in in robotic uh, i would say for doing a ukr i was impressed by the ukr of the robotic so i was not having that much confidence for doing ukr earlier with the conventional methods but with the robotic the ukr seemed very simple and uh, that made me move from navigation to robotics of course the sagittal plane the cuts uh, in 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 navigation you are still struggling to get the cut right you want zero zero on the screen but you are not getting it with robotic whatever you plan you are getting the same result you can again verify it the same way how you do it in navigation yeah so, i think what anup said is absolutely correct in navigation you are cutting with the jig so things can still go wrong in the slot and in robotic you are going to predict the effect of the cut what happens in navigation is you first cut and then check the effect here before cutting you are like doing a virtual cut and checking the effect of that so you know whether you are going to be right or wrong so anup you said it helps you in the sagittal plane so you mean for the slope of the tibia and the posterior condylar offset is that right yeah and the because flexion extension of the, of the yeah, femur, so femur because of this fine tuning suppose your flexion gap is slightly opening up you can increase the flexion of the femoral component so it's mm -hmm. fine tuning both the gaps to almost near perfection and what about coronal plane you yeah. mentioned coronal plane of course it's better control and most important we have observed is that almost always we put a 9 mm poly that's the thickness of the poly is reduced so there is no surprise opening of the gaps there is minimal over release so all those fine adjustments to coronal and sagittal plane as well right so tejas what did you say was once you have in the difference as we understand is between the robotic and navigation is robotic will execute exactly 
what has been planned right. which could not be done in navigation right. so precisely yeah, or it would take time with navigation so navigation would increase your surgical time so with robotic whatever you have planned it will be executed the same way it will reduce your time because of the speed of the burr and whatever you have planned the same thing is going to be executed so your time is going to save and you're going to get what you had decided or what you had planned for dr chandrashekar want to say something i totally agree with dr anup what says because flexion and extension of the femoral component it's very difficult to monitor uh, in the conventional not possible at all because with the intramedullary rod going in nobody has a control exactly what flexion extension goes in second is we are we are also moving into functional and kinematic alignment very difficult to do with with caliper measured resections with the with the kinematic alignment so robot de definitely executes in the millimeter accuracy that question will come that question will come, uh, that yeah. question will come. Yeah. okay so as as we understand uh, what has been told by the panel is robotics definitely helps there is an edge over the conventional definitely and there is also there is also an edge over the navigation surgery because we are able to execute what we have planned and we are able to show those numbers on the screen that this is the gap medially this is laterally in extension and flexion then go ahead with it okay so do you think there are any contraindications for robotic knee replacement uh, dr majan i think uh, very severely osteopathic people can be a disaster in case because of pins are quite thick 4 mm so you should be cautious you cannot do it you can be cautious about it a lot of very very stiff knee i don't think is amenable for a robotic surgery like no movement 30 degrees range of motion i think that can be avoided fair number of our practices rheumatoids so they are quite significantly osteopenic osteoporotic not that's bad on rheumatoids one but a standard rheumatoid can be done but you know extremely porotic the pin can walk in then i'm sure you should be bit careful i'm not saying you can't do it bit careful any other contraindication in your uh, practice Uh, well is i think the range has to be up to 60 70 degrees minimum okay anup yeah so currently my time with robotics is about 15 minutes more uh, per knee as compared to navigation so if i am doing a borderline medically compromised patient bilateral especially then i would choose to do navigated rather than robotic because of that half an hour extra that you are fast take. with a particular technology that's yeah. right yeah i think it's very difficult to robotic with a fused hip because the robot picks up hip center by the movement of the hip so unless you make the hip mobile it's very difficult to register the center of the hip so that's a very difficult to do this uh now tejas uh, this is a case with stress fracture uh, can you do robotic in this uh how how old is the fracture it a fracture probably the patient has come to the opd but must have been for there for about uh, two months or so if, so if it's a mobile fracture If it's a mobile fracture i doubt you can do it because there will be mob either you need to fix it up first and then use the robot because otherwise the movement will happen there there will be no stability for your pins uh then i would go for rather an intramedullary uh, fixation like putting a stem and then taking my tibial cut rather than going for a robotic so you'll go to anyone a conventional way of doing it conventional way of anyone else will like guess yeah yes chandrashekar so i i have done stress fractures which are like an impending stress fracture where i could still go put in my pins and then remove the pins and put in a stem extension but if it's a fresh fracture which is mobile i would rather not go for it i i have a take i have done a couple of them with even navigation with one robotic that you can if it's a mobile one you make your stress make sure when you're morphing it it's stress properly you can still achieve it and the rest of things can be done by, by rod the internal stem if it's a mobile uh, deformity put an external fixator align it then do the pins then do the cuts then intramedullary put a rod in and then you can come out you can put an x fix two pins yeah, on the bottom i think when they are mobile that doesn't mean that they are very mobile like a fresh fracture they are correctable mobile right yeah. or you can you can osteotomize the area yeah. and put an x fix and then yeah. go ahead do the how would you cuts. put the pins if you do robotic or you won't do robotic No. no i will do robotic i'll put external robotic. fixators yeah. correct the deformity then put the navigation pin yeah. in the metaphysis both yeah. the tibia and femur then go ahead and do the surgery yeah. i think you probably need to put the pins below the stress fracture so that you know your correction is quite right yeah. you use thin pins over here 3.2 pins other than 4.5 you may be putting them through the cortex rather than you know over here you can see that through the cortex 
and I think the correction and surgery goes extremely well. The seating of the tibia is like as if you've done an intramedullary remake. So they sit seat quite well, and you get a very good fit and good correction as well. Now, this is a case I think uh, Unmesh was saying about a very stiff knee. A patient about 35, 40 degrees flexion deformity. Can you do robotic, Mahesh? Yeah, you can do robotic in these uh, cases. You probably have to modify your protocol. And um, I use the Mako robot, so we use call, uh, something called as a mid-resection workflow for this, where uh, you can take a preliminary uh, reduced uh, distal femoral cut to get your knee into extension, and you can really proceed with um, the routine protocol. Yeah. There's a protocol in uh, Wellis about femur first. In the bad cases where you don't have much of flexion, you can still do the femur first and then do a tibia and otherwise you can do a tibia first. Then, then you measure the gap, basically yes, you do the femur because what happens in robotic is before you start cutting, you generally need to have an idea about your flexion and extension gap. Yes. So here you can't get the extension gap well. Yes. So you need do the femur cut first and then assess the extension yes. gap. That's what you mean. Yes. Anup, you want to say something? Yeah, so I think any robotic system is very valuable in sagittal plane deformities, especially FFD and recurvatum. Because you can actually assess post-implantation post what, what the correction is and you can correct them accurately. I, I think it is a good case for doing robotic. Yeah. Because you can plan your distal femoral resection like yeah. even in hyperextension or a flexion deformity. And that's, that's quite correct. And your and here, a 37 degree flexion deformity it was. Here probably there will be an issue of slight flexion extension mismatch with flexion gap being loose. And we'll have to do what we discussed. That's the best thing for robot. This is where the robot will help us. Robot is the best one. Resection will be is 10 mm over here as compared to conventional eight, and the posture is a bit less. That's the post-operative correction. Chandrasekhar, do you think is a disruptive technology? Do you think it is disruptive? I don't. I don't think so. You don't think anybody thinks disruptive? It's evaluated. No. Think disruptive? No. Do you? No. No. Anup. Disruptive in what, what manner? Sense? In, in the ask. sense that it's disrupting the conventional technology or conventional method or is it? You mean to say like, you know, we used to have, uh, I mean, in Marathi we call pade, tables in the past or before mobile, we used to remember everybody's, everybody's phone number. I mean, you don't need to do that now, you know. So you think that it's going to change. Uh, the method that you are practicing now or it's, it's probably going to disrupt the, you know, shake yeah, the... It's disruptive but an evolutionary method. Yeah. So it's evolving from mechanical to CAS Kinematic. to robotics. Yeah. So it's slowly evolving, I think. Yeah. So I Anup, think. while we are there, you've been doing mechanical for so many years earlier, then you jumped on to, uh, I mean, then you started navigation and then robotics. Now that transition versus someone who is doing mechanical, and straight away wants to do robotics now without having a step of navigation in between. How do you think this will work in his favor? Anup, you say, and then any one of you. I think patience. Patience is the key and you got to believe in the technology and do it. Don't post like eight cases with robotics. Do one or two and then gradually evolve from there. I think, uh, yeah, th th that's the next question is going to come. But here, why I feel this is disruptive? Because this is a case who has got a deficient uh, posterior condyle on the lateral side. So a experienced surgeon will not find it so difficult to place his sizing jig and get the rotation right. But a new surgeon will struggle. Somebody who's two, three years post MS and somebody who's 30 years post MS, you know, they will probably have a different outcome in conventional surgery. But the robot will pick up the rotation quite easily because it's going to go by the, uh, the transepicondyle axis. It doesn't need to know where the posterior condyle is. And probably the outcome in the hands of both the surgeons will be the same. That's what actually I have seen also. And there are papers suggestive that the residents and fellows who have done TKRs by robotic, their alignments are better than the, uh, the alignment by the professors uh, who have done conventionally. Million, but in that sense it is dis disruptive. Yeah, I think that's probably right. But one should have a knowledge of conventional oh, yes. TKR no, no, without no. fail. I, I, I don't think that you can do without conventional knowledge. What I'm just trying to say that somebody with you know two years experience and done some 100, 200 knees will struggle to get the rotation right in that particular patient. Yeah. But uh, the robotic surgeon will get it right even if he's... To put it safe, a good conventional surgeon is going to be a good robotic surgeon for yeah. sure. You're not a good conventional surgeon, you're not going to be a good robotic surgeon yeah. according to me. 
So uh, we have yeah, to understand here that we have to learn our conventional techniques very well and understand because robot is just there to help you. It is just there to quantify things what you're going to do. It's mm. not going to do anything for you. It's not a brain. It's basically your brain and its arms. Has the alignment philosophy changed for anyone? I mean, all of us have grown yeah. like a mechanical axis surgeon. But I, I mean, changed? in the initial few uh, days, days after the adoption of technology, I was um, pretty um, conscious of only following mechanical alignment because that is what has been taught to me. And you can execute it to perfection. You will get zero, zero everywhere. And unfortunately, um, you will see that post-operatively the patients will look to you in a little degree of valgus if you correct them to zero, zero. Maybe as mechanical alignment surgeons without any jigs, we were probably leaving them a little bit of varus. So what I have done is I have changed to functional alignment. I'm not bold enough to go for kinematic alignment. I have probably allowed my tibia to fall into a couple of degrees of varus um, uh, and a little bit of uh, um, not more than three degrees of varus in the overall leg alignment. But I have certainly become bolder over the past one year of accepting functional alignment or adjusted mechanical alignment. I go for a standard mechanical alignment, but I, I don't correct one or two degrees of varus at the end of it. I leave it as it is. I won't go after it to zero. So, but alignment, the balancing has to be good. That's all. I have moved on from mechanical to functional for sure because it's giving you the play of uh, keep keeping your tibia in two degree varus or your femur. So, and I think that's making me release less with, of course, uh, equal gaps, rectangular gaps. So, I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Rather, I feel when we were behind mechanical, mechanical, most of the obese females never used to be happy with their thighs rubbing against each other. So I think we are, we, we are learning also with the robot because it's giving us an insight into so many things. So many things you can see on the screen which we never knew when we were doing the conventional. Of course, navigation was giving us an idea but yeah, surely moved on to functional. Dr. Jarani? Yeah, so we look at the preoperative phenotype of the patient. If the patient is a straight, tall male patient with femoral valgus angle 5 degrees CPAC classification, so we try to get a mechanical alignment. If the patient has got constitutional virus with bowing of tibia high neck shaft angle, we try and do kinematic. But all this can be well controlled with robotics. Very difficult to control it precisely with manual conventional instrumentation. So it's patient based. It's not all or none. Very difficult to say 95% of my cases are mechanical access, 5% uh, uh, functional alignment. Some of the heart still goes towards the conventional mechanical axis. I don't know why. It's just difficult to accept functional and get up in the morning and see an X-ray and virus. Somehow still my heart is not agreeing for that. But 5% of my cases are functional alignment. So it's just our habit that the way we are trained to see our post-op X-rays. Because see, now if we think that this uh, CPAC classification is helping us to get a perfect alignment, not mechanical, but you know, for individual that patient, we may have to probably learn how to look at our post-op x-rays. I mean, that's what probably would be the comment rather than, yeah. oh, it is in a degree I, or two I, of virus, yes. it's not looking good. That shouldn't be probably the point. I think, I, so we'll I, I think what is important, as uh, Dr. Ulmesh said, is that balancing is most important. And if you're using the alignment for balancing, I think that is quite fine. You know, whatever is the alignment, the knee has to be balanced at the end. You know, that's very important. Like sometimes, uh, you know, going from uh, mechanical to functional is quite easy. But, you know, as a person to go from functional to kinematic, I think is a lot of stumbling block is there. But uh, most of us have definitely now changed to functional element. Like this lady who had a very severe virus deformity, uh, you know, to uh, uh, keep, give a two degrees of virus uh, or three degrees of virus to the tibia, you probably have much less soft tissue release that is required. And if the knee is balanced, they are quite happy. So that's quite fine. Uh, Mahesh, you are using this technology for what applications, what surgeries you trust with robot? Hi, uh, all of them actually. I am using it very, very routinely for hip, hips, knees. Partial knee replacement numbers are a little bit less in my practice, but I am I'm, I'm sure that it is the best indication to use a robot. But I heard that you did a patel femur replacement as well. Yes, I have done the patel. I have yeah. completely forgotten. <laughs> but excellent result and it's a child's play to do a PFJ replacement. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely a child's play. Unbesh? These are the moment. Knee. 
Tejas? E and partial knees, but of course partial knees are lesser than total knees. Anup? Anup? Partial and total, the hip application is uh, about to come next year. So we'll take it when it yeah. comes. So total knees, 99% partial. They just started three months back, 8 to 10 partial. I mean, my practice partial knees are very less. I'm not a very partial guy, so I do a lot of totals. And total hip, the software is getting in August or September. So by the time I think I'll definitely do the total hip. It is so in partial knee, it is said that, you know, use of robotics and technology will definitely help get our uh, uh, get our outcomes because that's where we try to compare our TKR and uh, UKR. So in which particular aspect you think in UKR, robotic is going to help us. Chandra Prakash and uh, Anup. Because my, uh, I have done only 8 to 10 cases now in partial. What I see is uh, you can dynamically put the tibia the way you want to put in a couple of degree varus if you want, even in the partial knees also. And uh, what I feel is uh, it, it gives you more security as a surgeon because you know the numbers much before you cut. So you are assured that whatever your implant is going to fit in, uh, before the surgery itself, it, it's a guaranteed assurance that you are not going to be neutral or in valgus. Most of the time you will end up in just short of valgus. That assurance before you cut is there. So that gives more comfort zone for me. Dr. Jirani? Yeah, so most of the knees are early arthritis and they have the natural physiological recurvatum. 2, 3, 4, 5 degrees of natural recurvatum. Now you need to put that back at least 1 or 2 degrees. So you can't give FFD. And most of the planning and the... Um, adjustment is done on the femur side. So you can anteriorize or posteriorize the femur, proximalize or distalize the femur and take minimum of the tibia. And don't use any, any jigs, any, uh, that prevents any stress risers on the tibia, any saw which prevents any stress riser. So all great advantages for uni. I think what they just mentioned was very correct that, uh, you know, getting uh, a tibial cut with robotic is that much more easier and safer. You don't undermine the ACL attachment at all and uh, you are able to get the gap status and even the contact status between the femur and the tibia you know how their contact is going to be and that will be definitely a game changer you know with a good J curve implant they almost look like a normal knee if you the only thing the you get the indicated patient as Mahesh or Chandrasekhar mentioned in the cases are very few as yeah. questions so now precisely we've got about four minutes left are there any questions from the audience we have the panel you can come up with the microphone and ask the questions. If there are none, then we'll go ahead with our uh, cases and the discussion. Yeah, right, no. you can come up to the microphone while we get on with our As, presentation. Uh, and also what Mahesh mentioned is uh, with the hip uh, flow in a robotic, it is not just the version and inclination of acetabulum and femur. You actually get a virtual movement of the hip joint. So you know where the impingement is going to be at what degrees. And also the alignment is going to change when the patient sits or stands, you know, with the pelvic tilt, with the sitting position and standing position. You can see where the impingement will be. So I think that's going to be really a good functional outcome to the patient. So I think so, Dr. Chandrasekhar just touched on this a little bit on his talk. Uh, we have image-based robot, which has got virtual uh, model pre-operatively by the CT scan and uh, non-image-based. So apart from Chandrasekhar, anyone else who has thought in their mind what system they've bought, why image-based or imageless? Uh, Mahesh. You know, I have gone through uh, studying all the four systems and finally came down um, of the choice of robot dependent on whether it uh, executes all the three applications or four applications. So partial knee, patellofemoral, total hip um, and a total knee with an established implant which has got an ODEP rating of 15, so has been in circulation for 15 years with a proven track record. And the third thing is whether I am completely uh, sure that an image-based system is probably much more accurate uh, currently. We may move away from an image-based system, but currently I think an image-based system is probably what gives me the accuracy. I think uh, I am used to navigation which is a, a non-image-less system and in my setup, my hospital, I don't have a CT scan. I can't really send a patient. Patients are not that comfortable going away and coming back. And one person deployed only for the CT scan part and getting the things done. I was pretty sure I wanted a 
saw based but navigation the image list system so a bit of logistic issue yes. in your practice yes. uh, Yes. Even I was a navigator to begin with, so it was easier to move to an imageless system. And uh, also, I feel the time pre-op which you need to spend for an uh, image-based system would be more. Rather, I would spend more time in the OT on my uh, screen to plan the knee. And again, uh, I, I believe, though yeah, people are saying that the image would be more accurate, there are osteophytes in there. Uh, and I think my, because you've been navigating since quite some time, you're quite confident about your registration. And so you can go ahead with an imageless system. Yeah, two, three factors. I think first is which implant you're most comfortable with. So you have to take it the other way around. Contrarian view is that if you're comfortable with one particular implant, like Dr. Milind has been doing a striker for so long, that it's easy to translate that into that technology of that particular company. So I am pretty, I am very comfortable with Smith Nephew implants. And that's why it's easy for me to adapt to that technology. Okay. And second was cost as well. Right. Yes. Uh, Image-based robots, because I've uh, been navigating for eight years, there were definitely some shortcomings in terms of marking the ma malleolites. Sometimes it can go erroneous for sure, because big fat patients, malleolar markings are not easy at all. And second is epicondylar marking with soft tissue wrapped around it, it's, it's not easy. There can be awareness. So, yes, for me, image-based core source because I always have a registration points which can be checked on the system. And it's the same uh, markings. It markings doesn't change whether image or imageless, but I have a proof of what I have done. So, probably as yes, image-based robots for me. Yeah, that's what I think two points mentioned there are very important, I think, that generally what you know, conventional surgeons have generally gone to the, the one with CT scan and the navigating surgeons have gone for the imageless, uh, you know, robot. Quite often I've seen that and also what implant you are used to. But just one last question I wanted to ask you. If you have a juxtra articular, uh, you know, deformity, uh, do you think that the one with CT scan, the image one or the imageless one, which one will do well in this particular case? I mean, I the patient that. has a severe posterior slot of the tibia, and when you are mapping, uh, do you think you can map the whole thing? Or if you have a CT scan of the, the proximal one-third or one-fourth of the tibia, that will give you a better 3D. See, basically, we want a 3D model of the leg and the uh, knee. Correct. For extra articular deformities, yeah. especially in the metaphyseal area, yeah, yeah. probably the image based yeah, is Because better. in this particular case, a severe slope of the tibia is there. And if you probably give the same slope to the tibia, it's not right. If you give normal slope, you cut a lot of bone from the anterior tibia, which will give you a loose extension gap and a tight flexion gap. To know that from before, before doing the cut is very important. So here actually distal femoral resection was quite less so that the extension gap doesn't become too loose. And the posterior resection was quite high to give you a proper flexion gap. And you can actually get a CR implant in this particular patient as well if you properly plan your bone resection. Thank you very much. I think we've just short over the time. Interesting discussion we had, all the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank so, you. Thank you. A big round of applause to all the panelists, I the chairman. I think we should congratulate both of you because it, you put a lot of thought into the questions. Correct. Congratulations to both of you more than us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.